Casual Diary Podcast, episode 345. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because we are going to have some fun. We're going to have some fun, well, kind of with your wallet, but through your head. And I think you're going to enjoy the content. And most importantly, if you are ready, you're going to be willing and able to take tons of notes so that you have the ability to go out there and grow your cash flow. I have with me today a lifestyle entrepreneur. What does that mean? I, we're going to find that out. But what it also I think is awesome about all of us as entrepreneurs is the idea that we're just not one dimensional. He's also describes himself as an adventurer. And many of you probably know him as a performance coach. I have someone with me who I think will be able to help you get past some of those roadblocks that thinking that can get in our own way to being able to build our cash flow and make great things happen. Most importantly, his name is Jarek Robbins. And if you are watching us live right now, you are in for a treat. Why? Because I can capture your questions and you can ask him directly if you'd like to do that as well. So make sure that you're following us and we will do our best to get all the information that you guys need to know today. So let's get started. Jarek, you there? I'm here and excited. Thank you so much for having me. Glad that you have decided to join us. Thank you for being here. Um, I have to ask you, though, the question that I ask everybody the first time that they're here. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So, you know, Batman, Robin, Superman, Wonder Woman, what have you. I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Chief among them is that, well, we occasionally get dressed up, <laughs> at least in our own head. Maybe sometimes we wear tights. We do all kinds of interesting things, but we th believe we are saving our, our customers using our products and services, etc. Also, like superheroes, entrepreneurs have a beginning. You know, if you think about Spider-Man, before he was, well, Spider-Man, he was just kind of taking pictures and going to school. So what we want to know is, before being a lifestyle entrepreneur, before describing yourself as an adventurer, before the performance coaches, before the stages and the television uh, shows and everything else that you've been on and doing, who is Jarek Robbins? Um, really simple. I, I guess if I were to look from an outside perspective and introspective at the same time, the, the piece that's consistent in every single thing I really do, um, and, and it, it's heart, it's just mm. caring. Mm. And, and if you want to know who I am and what I do, I, I care. And, and I care about others. I care about strangers. I care about just what's going on. And, and, and I care enough to be willing to do something about it. And, and so that thought process right there, I remember – I really wanted to meet Seth Godin and, and a, a friend of mine was trying to connect me and we went back and forth and he, he turned down three or four interview requests we were sending his way. Mm. Uh, and eventually someone was pretty persistent and he, he wrote back a very clear email that says, no is no, please understand and respect it. <laughs> we were like, wow. So we were like, I know the guy recommends persistency, but we were a little too persistent because we got smacked down and believe it or not, within, I think within a year of that email, I ended up speaking at the same conference he was speaking at. So I was hired to speak there and, and I walked in and they're like, oh yeah, you know, you just got here. Seth's up right after you, you know, one speaker after blah, blah, blah. He's here. Do you want to meet him? I was like, sure. Love to meet the guy. And it was funny because <laughs> I walked back and it was kind of an awkward situation because literally within, I think eight months prior, he was very clear on saying, no, I don't want to talk to you. And I don't think it was talk to me much less be on our show, but um, same, same. 
And, and, and so we knocked on the door. She went in and talked to him. And then he came out and really quietly and humbly just introduced himself. Nice to meet you. You know, good to know you. Glad uh-huh. you, you know, hi. <laughs> and there wasn't a whole lot there. It was just a quiet hello. And, and I'm going to get back to work now. Thank you for stopping by. And then he went on his way. And it was interesting. And, and at the very, very, very end, yeah. I remember hearing a story of his experience where his children um, are in his business. And, and he always talks about being the purple cow, being different, standing out, going your own direction, doing your own thing. Right. And, and, and it was interesting. And, and I heard that one of his sons, I think, works in the mail department of his company. And I was like, well, that's a fascinating situation. Yes. So after he gave this entire speech of standing out, being different, carving your own path, forging your own trail, I raised my hand at the very end and, and, and he called on me. And just Q&A. And I said, hey, what would you say to your child who might entertain being in the same business as you, literally? Mm -hmm. What would you do to inspire them to forge their own path, to be their purple cow, to go their way? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very interesting because he took the question. I was literally asking about his son. You're right. Um, Because I was curious. (laughs) Like with a dad who preaches that much, go your own route. Right. How did he land up in the same company? And and, and to turn it back around, though, he looked at me and he says, let me answer your question a little deeper so it makes sense for everyone here. He looked me straight in the eye in an audience of a thousand people. Mm -hmm. And he says, the reason you specifically, the reason you really, truly matter in this world he says, I, I know you, I know what you've done. I know what industry you're in. I know you have family in the same industry. He said, the reason you really truly make a difference is because of how big your heart is and how much you care. It's clear in everything you do. And I've only had 15 seconds to figure out who you are when you were emailing me. But that's what makes you stand out. And if I were to tell anyone in this room, forging your own path has more to do with how you choose to show up personally you know, being successful has more to do with how you choose to show up personally, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the heart you bring to the game than anything else. Because regardless of the results, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some, you're going to make some, you're going to, you know, mess it up. And and he said, regardless of all that, how you showed up and what you brought to that table is the uniqueness that makes your fabric you. And I remember thinking, wow. And, and, And that caused me in answering your question, that caused me to look back at just about everything I've been doing and realize, wow, the fabric that makes me me is just how much I care. And, and that's not unique to me. There's millions of people who deeply care about others. And there's millions of people who don't at the same time, though. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> that part makes me me. So if you ask who I am, heart, caring. Got um, it. Someone, who, someone who's willing to show up and, and, and lend a hand and make a difference. Well, I, I think that's a, a trait that many entrepreneurs would share. Is I, I, at least I would hope they would share because they, they would care about their, you know, how their product or service, you know, solves a problem, et cetera. But yet there's this – what I like about what you said is that you were talking about carving your own path, which can occasionally be fraught with dangers or at least perceived dangers ahead. Um, I get the privilege of dealing with a lot of entrepreneurs uh, that are at the beginning of their real estate career or beginning of building assets and something that comes up spot. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, good. So you can help me help them, but go ahead. Let me throw this out there real quick. It's a tough spot to be in because in the beginning of any industry, in the beginning of any journey, um, if it's a fitness transformation, a financial transformation, a health transformation, a business transformation, if it's something where you're not where you want to be and you're trying to make that transformation happen, that's exactly what we do in coaching. Right. We get people who show up and, and we usually try not to get them at the beginning of their journey. Um, just, I know where I work best and I work best with someone who's usually already figured out the basics, already figured out what to do, already figured out the systems and processes, but they're struggling to consistently perform at them. That's where I catch them because uh, analogy of what we like to do with people, we bring them in just like they were to show up, um, at Olympic training camp. And mm-hmm. as they arrive, mm-hmm. I ask them what their goal is. Mm-hmm. Are you just trying to, you know, have the memory that you got to go to the Olympics? Are you trying to actually become a medalist? Are you trying to win? Are you trying to beat the world record? Are you trying to go faster, further, longer, quicker than any other human being has ever done? What do you really want? And someone's able to tell me that. And based on what they really want, at that point, we now have a discussion with them. And the discussion becomes, well, how do you match up? (laughs) You tell me you want to be that fast. You tell me you want to jump that high. You tell me you want to do those things. How how, how how well can you perform right this second? 
And they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, let's get a stopwatch. Let's take you outside and I'm going to yell go and we're going to see what happens. And, and this becomes the first piece. So when someone's in the beginning, a lot of times this is really what they need more than anything else. They've gone and gathered the information. They've figured out what they need to know in order to be able to perform at a high level. Once they've gathered that, and if you're a resource for that, brilliant. I always say, um, you know, regardless if it's 16, 18, or 45 when you first leave your parents' home, you have to go <laughs> figure out what works. And and there's a lot of truth in that, that the end of that statement because nowadays some people stay at home uh, until they're 40, you know, 30-something, 40-something years old, and they might not be physically living at home, but financially, oh, they're living at home. Right. Right. What does that mean? 45 year old man or woman struggling to pay their cell phone bill because they couldn't figure it out this month. And mom or dad steps in to help them out. Nothing wrong with hitting a hard time. We've all had them. We all will have them at some point. We all make silly decisions. And, and, and even life throws us curveballs from time to time. That happens. I'm just saying if you're 45, 47, 35, 37, and each other month, you have to go ask mom or dad for a little help on the cell phone bill something's off yeah in my perspective nothing wrong with the community <laughs> helping a community but when you have a 14 year old or i think he was 13 the little guy who does bow ties oh the little Mo's guy bows. Who does bow yeah. ties. yes mo's bows right right yeah this dude's got a six-figure business with 10 or something employees <laughs> and he's running himself he's like 13 years old so when he can figure it out and really crush it as a young entrepreneur, right. I'm sure you can at least get a job by 37. <laughs> it, it, one would and, think. One would think. Yeah, you'd hope. You really would hope. And, and, and if you at least have a base job, you've handled the basics of, of what works and how to get a little momentum here. And then the next step, though, is you have income coming in. So what are you doing with it? You don't need the new iPhone 7 or whatever it is. You don't need the new computer. You don't need flashy cars and expensive suits. You don't need that stuff at a base level income. What you need is to invest in things that actually grow you so that you become the type of person that can now strategically earn even more than what you're earning right now. So the first investment, if you're looking for investment opportunities as far as a business person, mm -hmm. at the very beginning, you need to reinvest in yourself until you get yourself up to a place that you can command the type of fees or salary or commissions that you believe you deserve. And, and, and deserve isn't like, you know, I was born, I don't know, I was born brown. So that doesn't mean anything and it doesn't deserve anything. I'm just a human being and I don't deserve anything unless I'm willing to go put that value into the world around me. So at that point, what you deserve, meaning in your heart of hearts, what kind of value do you believe you can bring to life? And based on how much value you can add, what is that really worth? And, and there's your perception of what it's worth, but then there's the market and reality's perception of what it's worth. Meaning you believe, you know, I think what I add to the world is billions of dollars of value. You go out to the world <laughs> and you find out what the world thinks it's really worth. <laughs> usually a little bit less than that. Uh, usually, usually, but not Most always. Most likely in the beginning, <laughs> at least in the beginning. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So when it comes down to it, though, when when we're going through this, this journey, this becoming an entrepreneur, I mean, I know there's a number of people who are listening right now who want to build something bigger, better, better than what they currently have. And they've been endeavoring yep. to do so for quite some time. What would you say is the disconnect between how we're thinking, how they're thinking versus the reality in the, you know, that, that they're currently experiencing. What, what is the generalized, if you can, or specific, even better, uh, idea or concept that that's missing to allow them to function and produce and finally, you know, build the, their dream, so to speak. Handful of things. Um, the, the, the first place to start is a difference between, and, and I saw this on a quote the other day, so thank you, Instagram, for the inspiration on this <laughs> thought. Um, right. but, but a entrepreneur versus an entrepreneur. Right. An entrepreneur has an idea, mm -hmm. and six months later, there's a business around the idea actually doing something with it. A entrepreneur has an idea, and 12 months later, they still have a great idea. <laughs> yes, okay, so got if, it. If I were to start from the beginning, someone that actually wants to start a business, build a product, build a service, do something, the very first step, and, and I have a friend who used to tease me. He called me Forrest Gump back in the day. Oh. And 
he, he literally said it. He, uh, we were sitting down. He was dead serious. He looked at me. He's like, you know what? You know who you're just like? I was like, who? And he's like, y- you spot on. You're just like Forrest Gump. Uh, okay. Please explain. And I remember having a pause and literally trying to contemplate in my head, is that a good thing or a <laughs> right. bad thing? Did right. Did he just totally diss me or was that a nice compliment? <laughs> no clue. And, and I'm like, because this guy is kind of an interesting character. He did very well for himself and he did some really interesting stuff that wasn't so elegant, let's just say. Right. And, and so in watching that and experiencing that, um, the <laughs> – the thought is that he called me for his gump. And I, so I pause a second. I'm like, thank you. I think, what does that mean? And he says, you're the first person I've ever hung out with. He was my roommate at the time. He says, you're the first person I've ever hung out with that literally would sit down on a Thursday afternoon and say, I think this would make a great business idea. And on Friday, you would literally have the business <laughs> set up and be taking your first order. Nice. He's like, you're the first person I've ever seen do that. And I remember being like, really? There's right. lots of people who do stuff like that. And, right. and so the entrepreneurial aspect, and I'm, I'm not Mr. Entrepreneur. I'm not on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine yet. I will be someday. Possibly we'll find out. <laughs> uh, but but the, the concept is the entrepreneur sits down. The moment they see a niche in the marketplace, the moment they see a place where something's missing – they do something about it. If you go back, Richard Branson has a great story of how he started Virgin Airways. He was trying to get a flight back to, I think, Necker Island, and all of a sudden, the all the flights were canceled for some reason. Hmm. And he remembers sitting there thinking, this is total and utter crap that I'm stuck at this airport with all these other people, and there's not a single plane that can get us there. Seriously? <laughs> and he walked around, and he saw this little counter for charters, and he went over, he said, how much is it? And they told him, and he's like, well, I don't want to pay that out of pocket. So he said, well, hold on. How many people can it fit? And they told him the number. And he, he said, can I borrow your whiteboard, your dry erase board back there? He took the dry erase board. He, he wrote on it. And I think he literally said Virgin Airways or whatever airways he called it, wrote a line and then write a price and said, you know, flight leaves at 20 minutes from now or something. And he held it up and he walked around to all these pissed off people sitting in the airport because their flight was canceled. <laughs> right. And he enrolled. He added value. He found a, a gap in the marketplace. He found people who were frustrated about it. And he brought a solution straight to the situation and literally walked around with the sign and got his first, I don't know how many passengers of Virgin Airways to sign up, say they'd pay the price. He walked them all over the charter desk. They all put their credit cards down or cash. They bought the plane. He got in it and it flew his first flight, you know, where, where he initiated the flight. Right. It's like, boom, Virgin Airways was born. And now they've done pretty well for themselves around the world. Well, OK, so this brings up something that's uh, that I've heard before. And I know that many people have is is the, the question becomes they ask me, well, Jay, how did you see that? How did you see that mm. that 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 little opportunity? How did you put all of those pieces together to be able to to make that happen? I mean, how does one develop that that we'll call it Branson like ability to go oh look we all have a common problem right now and here's the potential solution i don't want to pay for it cuz so many people would have stopped that oh that's how much the flight cost i guess i can't go but yet yep. that didn't stop him and he was nope. able to figure out a way i mean he didn't wait for permission he didn't wait for licensing uh, to be able to sell tickets he didn't wait for any of that and nope. yet he saw it so what would you say is the 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 missing piece that allows a a entrepreneur to become an entrepreneur to see those little holes and and move. So the first piece is identifying gaps in the market that are real gaps because there's lots of people. I remember being young, and I'll tell you a flop that I had that was silly. But in the transition from CDs to digital music, mm-hmm. I remember it was really cool to download music and then burn it onto a CD. And I remember waking up. I remember day, that I actually, week too. That was I, I was living in a village in Uganda, <laughs> okay. and I was trying to come up with great ideas that I thought would absolutely transform, you know, places of the marketplace. And I came up with this idea, and my idea was to buy kiosk space in malls where okay. you could walk up, choose the songs you wanted, pay the ninety nine cents or whatever it was at the time, and literally have them burn directly onto a disc that you could pull out, walk outside, put it in your car, drive away with music. 
I was like, that would be awesome. Mm. And, and so I thought that was a gap. Truth is, that wasn't a big enough gap. That, that wasn't a real problem right. that I didn't realize. Like, it was cool. And here, here's something a mentor of mine taught me in the business world. Is it a Band-Aid or is it a aspirin? Because a Band-Aid, you fix a paper cut with. A paper cut hurts momentarily, but five minutes later, it doesn't matter and you don't care. An aspirin, that's aching pain that will not go away, that's continuously hurting so much that you physically feel like you can't get beyond it without doing something about it. Got it. So that's the piece you're looking at. When you identify something, does it need a Band-Aid? Does it need a little quick fix and, and it's over? Or does it need a real genuine aspirin, something that can help hold off the pain long-term consistently? And aspirins fade away, but again, it's repeatable. So if you need an aspirin, every six hours you need it. You only need one Band-Aid. And so that thought process with Virgin Airways, the gap in his marketplace was a fun, sexy, energetic, exciting airlines. There wasn't one. It was boring and old and, and fussy at the time. And so he created this new sexy airlines that exist. And now there's plenty of them that do stuff like that. Southwest is hilarious and fun to travel <laughs> on here in the U.S. Yes. And they're, they're competition now. But that thought, he saw something that needed an aspirin and he went in and he became the aspirin for it. It wasn't a Band-Aid. You know, what I saw in, in the initial piece of CDs burned to or music burned to CDs, it was a Band-Aid. It was cool. But three months later, when you could do it at your home, why in the world would you do it at the mall? Right. Seems silly. It's a waste of time and money. Or so, you could plug your iPod straight into your car. Now it's completely obliterated as, as an idea. <laughs> right. Yes, totally, totally. That, and that makes sense. Now, in that process, because you as you mentioned, entrepreneurship is a journey for all of us. There's ups, yep. there's downs, there's very low downs, there's very high ups. And that could be in yep. one day. So yeah. <laughs> the question that we actually have from someone watching right now, Preston, he's asking, so how on earth, given that, you know, roller coaster ride, or it could look like a stochastic chart, et cetera, how, given that, how does one stay motivated? More specifically, what do you do to stay motivated? You realize that every goal that you desire is obtainable, right? The challenge is how long will it take you? Well, fortunately, you're going to find that answer out as you hear the rest of this particular episode. But more importantly than all of that is to help you help me help you. What does that mean? That means in this particular case, keep listening. Keep sharing with friends. Guys, you're doing a great job, but just understand this one thing. Perseverance is key. Many of the things that you want and desire, again, they can be yours if you just don't quit too early. Some of the tools, tips, and techniques that you've gained by listening should be helping you continue to put one foot forward each and every day. And I know, not every day is rosy, but that's okay. No one said it was going to be anyway. With that being said, if you want to get some insight onto some other ideas of how to deal with and stay motivated, do me a favor. Just go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Again, that's cashflowdiary.com forward slash free book. Pick up a free copy of my book, Cashflow Diary, 10 Steps to Creating Wealth in Any Economy. I believe it will help you get started going in the correct direction. Now, let's get back to listening how Jared does it. Um, so, so motivation if you were to take this concept, it, it's really easy. Old, old, old way to think about it. But motivation is like a bath. You got to do it daily. Um, otherwise, it doesn't work as well. If you do a bath <laughs> once a week, you're going to be that smelly kid that no one really likes to stand next to. And, and so the concept of if you're going to do this daily, I use a concept called filling and fueling. And what that means is if you take a high-performance vehicle, let's say you're going to go into a car race and you have a high-performance, these things cost 500 grand, a million-dollar vehicle. And, and these are high-performance. They're not luxury. These things are meant to go from zero to 100 miles an hour in a half second and then go back to zero to do a hairpin turn and pick up speed again. They're remarkable. And if you're going to have one of those and you're going to be one of those, the question is what kind of fuel do they put in the tank of that beast of a machine? You know, regardless if you're in the Monaco Grand Prix, the Indy 500, the NASCAR, whatever, regardless of what you're doing, 
you put high performance fuel into that vehicle. You would not stop at Shell and drop in, you know, the low grade <laughs> fuel and hope you're going to perform at high high speeds at that race. And so most of us see ourselves and we want high performance kind of results out of life. We want a hundred percent of the results, but we go to the fuel tank and we go, uh, I'm gonna skimp on this round. I'm gonna put the, the cheap fuel in my car. So the cheap fuel becomes watching TV, not doing anything at all or not fueling up. I don't have, I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I don't have what it takes to fuel up right now. So I'm just going to skip it today. I'm going to skip fueling up my mental, emotional, spiritual tank today. And so you show up at the starting line of the race called today and you hope whatever you have in the tank from yesterday is enough to hold you over to win this race. Truth is, it isn't. It never is. And so you have to two things. Starting off, if you want specifics, you have to cleanse out all the junk that's left over from yesterday. Mm -hmm. And by cleansing it out, you can do that through meditation. Mm -hmm. You can do that through breathing techniques. Mm -hmm. I mean, easy way to do it if you take a deep, deep, deep breath in that just like in through your nose and you just breathe in. So... And at the very top, take a little bit more in and then just drop it all out through your mouth in one exhale and drop your shoulders and head too. And then do it again. If you do that three times, it literally resets your biological nervous system and it's, it's a reset. So it clears out all the junk you're thinking about or feeling in your body in that moment and allows you to then have space to fuel up with the good stuff. So the first part is find your way of clearing out, whether it's prayer, meditation, working out breathing techniques, something that just clears out all the junk from yesterday. It's gone. Now, when you've got a, an empty tank of fuel, the very first step that you're going to do here is you got to think, what are you going to line your tank with? I would say line it with gratitude. It's the most powerful and rich fuel in the world because if you take someone who's feeling like a anxiety, fear, frustration, like they're struggling or they're up against odds, mm -hmm. at that moment, if you stop and say, stop, what are you really, really, really tangibly grateful for in your life right now? And you get them to really genuinely feel it, not just go, I'm grateful I'm alive. I'm grateful I have a job. <laughs> I'm grateful I can breathe. Right. That's not feeling it. I'm talking about feeling it to the point you might get a tear in your eye because it's like, wow, someone right now this moment is about to live the very last breath of their entire life. I'm grateful I get another 24 hours. That's cool. Someone's right now, their heart is going to beat one more time and they're done. I'm grateful my heart without me doing a thing is going to beat 100,000 times today. You know, someone's going to get to see their relative, their child, their mom, their dad, their brother for the very last time today. I'm grateful I get to see my family tomorrow as well. Hopefully, knock on wood. And it's like, wow, you dig in, you find real deep gratitude. And that's your first lining the tank. From there, you got to fill up with what you're looking for, where you're going. So where are you going? What's your vision? What's your dream? And I always start out, I have vision boards that sit behind me on a treadmill desk that I get up every morning and I walk on and I stare at the images I've used to describe my health and fitness, my emotional fitness, my relationship goals, my financial goals, my business goals, my spiritual goals, my, or a contribution and making a difference goals. I have images surrounding me on those boards that describe every bit of it and represent those pieces in my emotional nervous system. And out loud, I speak aloud with total certainty my 20-year vision for my life. So I'm so grateful that 50 years from now, I'm stronger than ever before. At 50 years old, I'm healthier and stronger than the majority of 20-year-olds in the world. I'm so grateful that emotionally, I'm passionate about my life, living on mis mission, enjoying every moment life has to offer. So this next piece I'm alluding to is painting a future vision so clear and so real that you start to feel it in your body. If you want the science behind this, the science is – in your head, if you can clearly visualize, speak, and feel future rewards, if you can do it so vividly, what happens is your brain starts to kick off oxytocin and serotonin. And I'm sorry, not oxytocin, serotonin and dopamine. And those are pleasurable neurotransmitters and hormones in your blood and body that cause your brain to link up pleasure to what you're doing. How powerful are these? They stuck a rat in a cage. And on one side, they put a lever that gives them a food pellet. On the other side, they give them a lever that would stimulate dopamine and, and serotonin in the, in, the, in the brain, meaning just a pleasurable feeling. The rat starved to death because it just sat there all day hitting the one that gave it the pleasurable feeling in the brain and didn't even turn around long enough to click the other one and get a food pellet. 
That's how powerful that drug is in our brain. And the truth is we can kick it off at any moment we want by giving ourselves permission to feel good about something, to celebrate what we're doing. So in this moment, clearing out the tank, filling it with gratitude, um, and then at that moment, filling up with future anticipated visions and rewards and outcomes and goals and dreams of what you want and making it so vivid and real that you actually start kicking off the pleasurable response chemically in your brain so that when you think about that goal, you think about those rewards, you feel the chemical response in your body, which causes you to become addicted to going after what it takes to get those rewards. So from there, you're talking about motivation. Put it this way. How hard is it for most people to quit smoking, to quit drinking Coca-Cola, to quit drinking soda, to quit off sugar? It's extremely hard because it's a chemical addiction in their body. Why not use that in our favor and purposely create those towards the things we really want instead of allowing other people to manipulate us and force us to do stuff that we don't just because we drank or ate their product a few times? <laughs> totally understood. Now, as I've listened to you in the time that we've been together, there's something that's underlying like every – the theme under every answer that you've given. And it seems to be, if I had to boil it down to a word, it would be the word intent or intentional. There's nothing that you're allowing, quote unquote, to happen by accident. Even though, yes, not everything is within our control, you're, you are taking responsibility for how to respond to the events as you're out there trying to build a business. You're taking responsibility for or the day from the beginning. You're You're putting yourself in a space in which... Well, you, you have a, a, an expected outcome. You actually wake up and have an expectation as opposed to, quote unquote, letting the day happen to you. So I have a question here because I know a number of people um, have had throw, this. Go ahead. Real quick, I'll throw something in here. What's that? So start your day with a clear expectation of what you want to achieve. End your day with total appreciation for whatever unfolded. It's a way to feel rich all the way through the journey. Got it. I think you you may have just actually answered the question because I, one of the things that I was going to ask is you you mentioned that we have to give ourselves or giving ourselves permission to feel good about what happened and I I was going to ask you why why is that why does that even need to be a thing and, and why is that so challenging for so many to actually give ourselves permission to feel good about the progress that we might have made as opposed to in, in, in enjoying that process as opposed to going, ah, oh, man, I didn't get my, you know, that deal didn't close today. I didn't get the, I didn't lose 15 pounds like I had hoped this week or whatever. What, what, where's the disconnect there? So there's a couple things. One is not setting realistic goals and constantly punishing ourselves for not being where we want to be. So let's say there's a, there's a man or woman who wants to lose Mm -hmm. 20 pounds. Mm -hmm. And so that they set up the system to constantly give themselves permission to celebrate the progress or do they set up the system to constantly punish themselves for not being at the goal yet? And, and let me show you the difference and I'll make it ridiculously obvious. <laughs> okay. Let's say you're trying to teach a kid or a child how to talk or walk, how to sure. walk. Sure. No, let's say talk. So, so you're trying to teach him how to say dad. Sure. And do you train him by punishing him every time he tries because he's not there yet? Or do you train him by giving him a token of appreciation every time he tries, knowing that he's getting closer? Yep. Uh, if you have children, you know you token them with appreciation and celebration yep. un as they're getting closer until mm -hmm. they finally get it. Same thing if you're training an animal. How do you get a dog to learn how to sit? You say sit. And you wait. And if it does anything close to sitting, you give him a treat. <laughs> and right. then you say sit and you wait. And if he does anything close to sit, you give him another treat. And pretty soon you say sit and he goes, dang, if my butt's on the ground, I get food. Yes. <laughs> and he doesn't know what sit means, but he knows that means treat is coming if I do this right. And you have to train yourself the same way. So what most people do is the opposite. They say, I want to lose 20 pounds. They step on the scale tomorrow and they've only lost no pounds. And they go, Ugh, I'm such an idiot. Why can't I do this? Ugh. Right. And they link up massive pain and frustration and anger and, and, and all this emotion negatively to working out. Yep. And they do it again tomorrow. Yep. More pain, more negativity, more frustration. They're going to do it again the next day and the next day. And pretty soon, they're like, screw it. I don't want to work out anymore. Right. 
I wouldn't either if every time I did it, someone <laughs> emotionally jabbed me with a javelin. That right. feels like horrible. Instead, if you take that same person and you want to get them results, you have them work out today, regardless of the result. And for most people, you're not going to see a significant result day one of going to the gym and walking for 30 minutes. But they do it. <laughs> you bring them home and you're like, yes, I'm so proud of you. Great work for putting in the first day of effort. High five. Give me a hug. I'm so proud of you. You're going to be a little sore tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Wake up. Just get out there. You'll feel better after you do. Man, I'm proud of you. Yep. And I hope you had that same pep talk with yourself every time you took action. Because what happens is pretty soon you do that 10 days in a row. You have that pep talk every time you come home. You start to feel really good about taking the action. So what I'm alluding to here is instead of rewarding yourself for the reward or the end result, reward yourself for putting in the consistent action necessary to get there. Got this it. is how you stay motivated in the beginning because in the beginning, you don't see a whole lot of results. It's no. like farming. You go out and plant seeds. You don't come back the next day and you're like, hey, there we go, a harvest. You'd be silly. You know, if you, if you were any person out there and you went to a farmer and said, hey, how fast do you get the crop? Two days, three days? What are you thinking? <laughs> You'd be like, what are you, new? It's not how seeds work, son. You put it in the ground and then you wait. <laughs> totally. <laughs> you don't really wait. You water it, you protect right. it, you care for it, you do all the work to finally get the reward to show up later. And most of us want instant results nowadays, and I like them too. You know, I work hard for those instant results. You know, 15 <laughs> yep. years to be an overnight success. It's usually how it works out instantly. Wow, you got there quickly uh, in that case. Um, so <laughs> that's uh, good. That's good. Now, I have a question as we end up here, uh, because I, I know there's there's one more person who we haven't talked to yet and th we'll make this the last question because i know you you gotta go my my question is very simple though there's uh, a person who's been listening this entire time and you know let's pretend that they're standing in front of the superhero outfit store they they think they're ready to be this entrepreneur thing they want to make it happen however in the back of their mind they know and they hear the voice and Jarek, I know you know the voice. You've dealt with the voice. You, you we, we that that voice is ever persistent. It's that voice that comes up anytime they want to be bigger, better, better. They want to be bigger than their present place and actually make something happen for themselves. And for some people, they're actually related to the voice, so they have to deal with it. My here, here is my direct question: What if you knew that they would actually follow through and do in the next twenty-four to forty-eight hours exactly what you would say? What you're going to tell them to do, they would follow through, man. What would you tell them to do? Um, really simple. What I would ask them to do is figure out how to design the absolute ideal day-to-day -day life they'd like to be living. Doesn't matter how simple, doesn't matter how complex it is, that's up to them. But whatever truly makes them feel alive, and, and alive meaning at the end of the day, a friend of mine wrote a book, and in the book, he talks about three questions you have to answer at the end of your life in his circumstance, but I'd say at the end of the day. And the first question is, design the type of day, day-to-day -day life, that if you were to go live, at the end of that day, you could ask yourself the question, did I really live? Meaning, when life presented me with the opportunities to make the most out of this day, to really squeeze the juice out of life, did I take advantage of it and do it? Did I show up? Did I live it? Did I fully, really live? They say yes to that too. Did I really love when life gave me a moment, a little glimmer of an instant to reach out to someone and love them profusely and passionately and deeply to show them how much I care and how deep and meaningful they are to me? Did I really truly step up to the plate and give my all and give my heart and soul in that moment? And finally, did I matter? By the way I chose to live my life today, will there be a ripple that exists far long after I'm here physically on this planet? And if you were to design the type of day-to-day -day life, something you could do in any city on earth every single day, this is the exact pattern you'd want to go through, what would be in your absolute ideal day to know that you really lived, you really loved, and you really mattered at the end of that day? And once you can describe that day, here's what I'd ask you to do. Go out and learn what it takes to turn that day into absolute reality for yourself. Two, live it. Take the information, apply it ferociously, and get the life, get the results you desire and deserve. And my call to action would be finally when you figure out what works and you figure out how to do it, turn around and pay it forward. Yeah. Find a way to share what's worked with you to other people 
to give them another example of what's possible, not as the five golden pillars of whatever, just to show them, hey, I don't know if this will work for you, but it worked for me, and I hope it helps you on your journey. Here's what I got. Indeed, indeed. So well, I know there's a number of people who, are, who have listened, and they probably want to find out more about what you're up to. What's going to be the best way for them to track you down and, and, and find that out? Oh, man. I mean, if you just Google me, Jarek Robbins, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, What's up, Facebook Live? Uh, they're listening right now. Uh, <laughs> Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, my website. If you want more information on how to design that ideal day, we have a specific, I think, 30-minute audio program and a whole PDF download for free on my website if you go grab it. Um, that'd be the best places. So jerickrobbins.com or just Google Jerick Robbins and everything will compile there and choose which when and where you hang out with us. Excellent, sir. I want to thank you for taking the time uh, to invest your knowledge, your wisdom, your insight here with us at the Cashflow Diary today. Thank you so much for having me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean today? That means, well, you know how to Google. Don't act like you don't. So go and get the information you need. But more importantly, take the action, make it intentional, and most importantly, live, love, and matter. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.